Hi there, it's Friday the 8th of November 2019. I'm Steve Towers. Welcome to ITV. Let's get started. The only significant development in digital taxation this week occurred today. The OECD released its consultation document in regard to Pillar 2. The OECD has asked for public comments by the 2nd of December and it will host a public consultation meeting on the 9th of December. The document was released just before we finalised today's video. Thank you, Pascal. So I'm afraid you'll have to wait for next week's show to hear my comments. You can find a copy of the document and related information on our website or app. In this last week, there have been press reports in India that the Indian government is not happy with the profit allocation methodology of Pillar 1. And in Switzerland, the finance minister was quoted as saying that his country's annual revenue loss could be more than $5 billion. Meanwhile, the government of the Dominican Republic has included a digital services tax in its 2020 budget. The rate will be 10% and it will apply to online services which are provided to residents payment intermediaries will have collection obligations. It looks like the RECEP trade agreement will be finalised next year, but without India. Likely signatories will be the 10-member ASEAN bloc, China, Japan, Korea, Australia and New Zealand. Until this week, India was expected to join, but it announced at the end of the ASEAN summit that it will not do so. The OECD has released an update of its guidance on CBC reporting. For a copy of the updated guidance, please go to our website or app. A quick update on the MLI. According to the OECD, as at the 30th of October 2019, the MLI had been signed by 90 jurisdictions. It has been ratified by 37. It has entered into force in 33 and will enter into force in the other four jurisdictions in early 2020. For a copy of the OECD status table on the MLI, please go to our website or app. The UN has published most of the documents which were discussed at the October meeting of its Committee of Tax Experts. In last week's show, I gave you the proposed amendments to the UN's Transfer Pricing Manual. Here's a list of all the other documents which have been published. For a copy of these documents, please go to our website or app. In Australia, the tax authorities have issued, for public comment, draft guidance in regard to a common situation in asset acquisitions. If an asset is acquired for consideration, which includes the assumption of one or more liabilities, and the subsequent payment of those liabilities will generate tax deductions for the purchaser, then the purchaser's cost base in the asset for capital gains tax purposes, excludes the assumption of the liabilities. Public comments are requested by the 29th of November. For a copy of this draft guidance, please go to our website or app. In India, the Delhi Income Tax Appellate Tribunal has decided a transfer pricing case concerning the TP method to use for a strict risk distributor. The taxpayer company bears no inventory risk and very little market risk. 
and it does not perform any critical functions such as advertising, marketing, and inventory management. According to the tribunal, it executes group strategy and receives guaranteed returns and it cannot incur losses. Reflecting its lack of functionality, the taxpayer company has a very low ratio of operating expenses to sales. In that context, the tax authorities surprisingly claimed that the gross margin-based resale price method should be used. And for that purpose, it selected comparables which had much higher ratios of operating expenses to sales. As you would expect, the tribunal rejected that method and instead adopted the TNMM method, using operating profit as a percentage of sales as the PLI. And the taxpayers' results were found to be within India's tolerance range versus the arithmetic mean of its comparables. For a copy of this case, please go to our website or app. In Singapore, the government has announced that the supply of digital payment tokens is exempt from GST. In the words of a government minister, GST is chargeable only on the supply of goods and services, and not on the digital payment token itself. In Taiwan, the so-called cloud invoice regime for VAT will become mandatory for all non-resident digital suppliers effective the 1st of January 2020. This system has operated on a voluntary basis since the beginning of this year. For the link to the government's information portal, please go to our website or app. In Thailand, the government has published royal decrees which terminate various tax incentive programs. This move was announced by the government in 2018 and early this year in response to BEPS Action 5 on harmful tax practices. For information on the decrees, please go to our website or app. In Denmark, the government has published a draft bill which will make a number of international tax changes. Firstly, the amendment of Denmark's CFC rules to align with the EU's ATAD. Secondly, the transfer pricing documentation rules will be changed, including in particular a requirement that TP documentation such as the master file and country file, must be submitted to the tax authorities within 60 days after the due date for filing the corporate income tax return. Thirdly, amendments to the domestic law definition of permanent establishment to align with the MLI. And fourthly, the introduction of a provision to allow a Danish company to deduct final losses incurred by foreign subsidiaries, foreign PEs, and foreign real estate, in accordance with ECJ case law. The finance ministers of nine EU member states have issued a joint statement calling on the European Commission to initiate a debate on aviation pricing in the EU to ensure that the negative externalities of aviation, carbon emissions, are reflected in pricing. For a copy of this statement, please go to our website or app. In Germany, the Federal Tax Court has responded to the European Court of Justice's decision earlier this year in the ex-GmbH case. You'll remember that the ECJ was asked whether Germany's CFC rules breached the EU's free movement of capital in the context where a German company held 30% of the shares in a Swiss company. In its February 2019 decision, the ECJ ruled that, in principle, yes, the CFC rules do infringe on the free movement of capital. But after considering policy issues, such as whether the CFC rules are necessary to prevent tax avoidance, the ECJ identified a key residual issue. 
does a bilateral information exchange mechanism exist between Germany and Switzerland, which would allow the German tax authorities to confirm that the Swiss company was not artificial. The ECJ asked the German Federal Tax Court to determine that key residual issue. And that's what the Federal Tax Court has done in its recent decision. Its conclusion is that under the Germany-Switzerland Treaty at the relevant time, that is, before the 2010 protocol took effect, the German tax authorities were not assured of being provided with the information necessary to confirm whether or not the Swiss company was artificial. And for that reason, the court held that the German CFC rules did not breach the EU free movement of capital. For a copy of this case, please go to our website or app. In Italy, the bill for the 2020 budget law has been introduced into Parliament. A notable item included in the bill is the 3% digital services tax, which is stated to operate from the 1st of January 2020. For a copy of the bill, please go to our website or app. Also in Italy, the tax authorities have issued guidance in regard to the beneficial ownership condition in the EU Interest and Royalties Directive. A non-resident parent company made a loan, Loan A, to its Italian subsidiary. The non-resident parent then assigned Loan A as collateral to secure another loan, Loan B, which was made by a third party to the Italian subsidiary. Under the terms of the assignment of Loan A, the parent company relinquishes both the power to determine the use of the interest payments and the economic enjoyment of those interest payments. In those circumstances, the guidance concludes that the interest payments made under Loan A are not beneficially owned by the parent company, and thus the interest withholding tax exemption does not apply. For a copy of this guidance, please go to our website or app. In the UK, the Upper Tribunal has decided a case in regard to the definition of plant or machinery for the purposes of tax depreciation. The case concerns a taxpayer which incurred capital expenditure in relation to a hydroelectric power scheme. The tribunal held in favour of the taxpayer. For a copy of this case, please go to our website or app. Also in the UK, the government has issued regulations in regard to the offshore receipts in respect of intangible property legislation, which was enacted last year. For a copy of the regulations, please go to our website or app. In Kenya, the government is planning a law amendment which will require 100% of the tax which is in dispute and is being challenged in appeal proceedings to be paid up front. According to the president, there's almost $3 billion of tax which is held up in about 1,000 appeals. In Nigeria, Parliament has passed a bill which will allow government revenue from oil and gas production sharing contracts to be increased when the price of crude oil exceeds $20 per barrel. Parliament passed the bill in October and this week the President indicated that he will sign the bill into law. In Morocco, the government has presented to Parliament its draft finance law for 2020. Here are the items that caught my eye. Firstly, the existing tax incentive rate for corporate income tax will be increased from 17.5% to 20%. This tax incentive rate applies to companies operating in particular sectors, such as exports, tourism, real estate development, education, and certain mining activities. Secondly, the rate for the minimum tax will be generally reduced from 0.75% 
to 0.5%. And thirdly, the existing corporate income tax incentive rates for companies operating in free zones and in the Casablanca finance city will be increased in both cases to 15%. For a copy of the draft finance law, please go to our website or app. Well, South Africa has won the Rugby World Cup, but the South African economy has been a poor performer amongst developing countries for many years. And in that context, you can understand why some commentators have noted that in the government's economic statement on the 31st of October, there was no mention of the Manufacturing Allowance Tax Incentive, which is due to expire on the 31st of March, 2020. In Argentina, the tax authorities have issued a resolution which establishes a VAT and income tax withholding regime for payments made by electronic means, effective the 19th of November. For a copy of the resolution, please go to our website or app. In Colombia, the government has issued a decree on the income tax treatment of private equity funds, collective investment funds, and permanent establishments. For a copy of the decree, please go to our website or app. In Mexico, the bill for the 2020 budget has been passed by Congress, despite the lobbying by US technology associations. In Peru, the existing tax incentive, which exempts gains made on the transfer of shares through the Lima Stock Exchange, which was set to expire on the 31st of December 2019, has been extended to the 31st of December 2022. For a copy of the decree, please go to our website or app. And also in Peru, the regime which applies to REITs, which was also set to expire on the 31st of December 2019, has been extended to the 31st of December 2022. For a copy of the decree, please go to our website or app. In the US, there have been a couple of developments in regard to IRS enforcement of the 2017 US tax reform legislation. Firstly, the IRS has commenced a so-called active campaign in regard to the Section 965 transition tax. There's some information about this active campaign on the IRS website. For the relevant link, please go to our website or app. And secondly, in regard to the beat tax, an IRS officer has stated that the IRS can make transfer pricing adjustments under Section 482, which will increase a taxpayer's deductible related party payments, which of course, is the opposite of their usual stance. And now for this week's treaty developments. We've had one treaty signed, one mutual agreement signed, and two protocols enter into force. I have two articles for you this week. The first article is called Recent Amendments to EU, Luxembourg and US Tax Laws and Their Implications for US Holding and Financing Branch Structures. It's written by Emilian Labus and it's published in the IBFD's Bulletin for International Taxation. This article starts with the structure used by McDonald's involving a Luxembourg resident company with a US IP holding branch, which was the subject of a European Commission state aid investigation commenced in 2015. You remember that the Commission reversed its decision and closed the investigation in 2018. 
The article then explores four subsequent changes to the tax law which could have an adverse impact on such structures. Three of the law changes are in Luxembourg and one is in the US. The three Luxembourg tax law changes are these. Firstly, the introduction of CFC rules as a transposition of ATAD 1. Secondly, amendments to the domestic law definition of PE. And thirdly, the introduction of imported mismatch rules by other EU member states as transpositions of ATAD 2. These would be relevant if the branch structure is used to base erode other EU member states. The author concludes that the CFC rules would probably be denied operation to such structures by the Luxembourg-US Treaty. However, he considers that the other two changes pose significant tax risks for such structures. And the US tax law change is the anti-hybrid measures in the 2017 US tax reform legislation and the proposed regulations issued in late 2018. In the author's view, the use of US financing branch structures to fund group companies located in the United States is not expected to be tax efficient with retroactive effect from the 1st of January 2018, assuming that the proposed regulations would have been finalised by year-end 2019. This conclusion is based on the branch mismatch payment rules defined in the proposed regulations that would amend Section 267A of the Internal Revenue Code. The second article is called The French Crusade to Tax the Online Advertisement Business. Reflections on the French Google case and the newly introduced Digital Services Tax. It's written by Bob Michel and it's published in the European Taxation Journal. This article provides a detailed description and analysis of the Google Island case, which concerns PE status in France. The French tax authorities claim that the cost plus services provided by a Google French company caused the Irish company to have a contract concluding agency PE. Adopting a legal approach, both the court at first instance and the appeal court held that there was no such PE. And then, somewhat surprisingly, Google settled the case by paying an amount similar to what was claimed by the tax authorities. According to the author, public image concerns explain this about face. Then the article segues into a discussion of the French DST, including a comparison with the EU DST directive proposal. Well, that's the way it is this Friday, the 8th of November, 2019. I'm Steve Towers. Have a great weekend.